Father, we just give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. You are an amazing God. Father, we just want to come before your presence, Lord. We ask you to, today that, to light the fire in our heart. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, get, let us have a clear vision. Lord, we want to see you today riding on your white horse. We want to see you today, my God, with your eyes of fire for your love for your bride. We want to see you, God, just reaching out to us and, and asking us, would we like to come and have a ride with you in this, in this great, great end time revival that you're about to bring upon this earth? And Father, we just give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, and everybody said. I want to just share, if you remember last week, I think it was, that we, I, well, we, somebody read out for us about a particular prophecy that Dutch Sheets had, and uh, it was like an ambulance was in uh, with all these dead, half-dead people, or mostly dead people on board, and and uh, they were trying to, uh, they didn't understand what it was, but they said that it was the prayer people and the, the prayer has gone out of the church and, and, and that sort of thing has died. And the people that were working on these people were actually angels and they were trying to get life back into that movement, trying to get life back into it. And they said, they were saying, we can't get a heartbeat, we can't get a pulse, we can't, this, we can't find anything. And, and all of a sudden, one of the angels cried out, I'm getting a pulse, I'm getting a pulse. And the other angel said, what did you do to, to, to cause this to happen? What did you do? And they said, what we did was I started telling them the stories that happened many years ago. To, started telling them the stories of revival. And as I started telling the stories of revival, then the, the, the heartbeat came and, and the others started doing the same and all of a sudden these people all came back to life again. We're living in a time when it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. There is a battle that's going on in the, in the, in the heavenlies and, and also on this planet. There's a war raging for you and, your, and the church. Today, there's so many good ideas, there's so many good thoughts and things like that that the church can grab hold of to bring growth. But friend, we need a move of the Spirit, amen? We need a, a Holy Ghost move. I'm not criticizing, I'm not pulling down, but I'm just saying that we've got to be careful. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, it says that about we've got to take the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest we drift away. The words spoken through angels and all those things had to prove steadfast. And then it goes on to say, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a, a salvation? And what's easy is to drift away from the things of the Spirit to come into, into line with, with modern church or whatever we want to call it, political correctness. I don't know what you want to call it, but friend, I want to say we've got to come back to the old time religion. We've got to come back to uh, allowing the Spirit of God. We've got to come back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've got to come back to worshiping in the Spirit and in tongues or oh goodness knows what else. We need a move of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so I, I got out these, this, this revival book here. It talks about the Azusa Street Revival. And I've been just consuming this thing, just reading it and, and allowing it to wash over me. And, uh, and so I just highlighted a few things that I wanted to talk about. This story is a story, basically the beginnings of it anyhow, is a story about a man, a man that, that had a passion. Can I say, friends, we need to have a passion for Jesus. We need to have a passion for the Holy Spirit. We need to allow God to, to somehow or other get in our lives and, and do amazing things. And th this story is, is an amazing story. It says, uh, while attending classes and according to pastor of the congregation, Houston Seymour. He was invited to pastor a Los, a Angels, Los Angeles storefront holiness mission uh, whose parishioners were mostly black. This group had been expelled from the Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles because they had accepted the holiness teaching and the second blessing of sanctification on their lives. Can I say this? Most Baptist churches today are more Pentecostal than the Pentecostal churches. So I'm going to say some things here, but I'm not criticizing, I'm not pulling down, I'm not saying anything like that. But anyhow, somebody saw Seymour at this particular meeting and invited him to come to, to the church there and pastor the church. And it says, after prayerfully consideration, uh, Seymour accepted uh, and departed for Houston on February 1906. Seymour had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was 
but he was prepared to preach it without compromise. He talked about something that he hadn't yet experienced. You know, one of the things that we can do sometimes, we, we talk a lot about a revival that perhaps we haven't experienced. We talk a lot about a, an outpouring of the Spirit. But I want to tell you, friends, you can do something like that if you know God's going to do something. Amen. And I want to preach about a move of the Spirit without compromise. I may not have seen what I, what I believe is going to happen, but I want to preach it without compromise. I want to speak about it because I believe it's going to happen. Anyhow, Seymour uh, started to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And these people had, had a problem because they believed that the, the sanctification was, was the, the, the second blessing that, we, that Seymour was talking about. So they thought that he was preaching some sort of heresy. So when Seymour came to do the night service, he found that the church was locked up, padlocked, and he couldn't do it, uh, couldn't even enter into the place. Uh, the story goes on. You got to, it's, some, it's all over the place. But some members of the mission took uh, compassion on Seymour and invited him to stay at their homes of Edward Lee and Richard uh, Ashbury, Aspley or Ashbury, who lived at so so Bonnie Street. And uh, Seymour, driven by an almost overwhelming hunger for the power of the Holy Spirit. Friend, how many people really want that hunger again in your lives? Come on, come on. We've got to stir ourselves for the hunger of the Holy Spirit. Spent nearly all his time in prayer. Because of Seymour's devotion to prayer, the Ashburys opened their home to evening prayer meetings. Seymour told the group about a woman by the name of Lucy Farrow, who had uh, introduced him to the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were so excited to meet her that they took up an offering for her train fare and invited her to come. A few days later, Edward Lee returned home from work to find uh, Pharaoh had just arrived from Houston. He was so hungry for the baptism in the Holy Spirit that after a brief introduction, he implored, Sister, if you will lay your hands on me, I believe I will get my baptism right now. She replied, I cannot do it unless the Lord says so. <laughs> later, while eating dinner, Pharaoh rose from her seat, walked over to Lee and said, The Lord tells me to lay hands on you for the Holy Ghost. She laid hands on Lee and immediately fell out of his chair and while laying on the floor began speaking in tongues. Later that day, Lee and Pharaoh went to Ashbury's house for an evening prayer meeting. Edward Lee walked through the door, lifted up his hands, broke out in tongues. Suddenly the power of God flooded the room and virtually everyone present began singing in tongues, uh, speaking in tongues. One of those presents was uh, Jenny Moore, who later became Seymour's wife. She not only spoke in tongues, but also went to the piano and played and sang in tongues, though she had never had a lesson, an eyewitness said. Friend, there's things about the Holy Ghost we don't know. <laughs> there's things there that He wants to do that you couldn't even imagine. They shouted three days and three nights. It was the Easter session and people came from everywhere. By the next morning, there was no way of getting near the house as the people came. You see, when, when there's a move of the Spirit, the Spirit will bring people, amen? It's, there's something that we've got to, if we can break through into that realm, if we can just break through our natural mind, our natural thinking and get, into, uh, get a hold of the Holy Ghost and, 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 and the Holy Ghost comes down. I want to tell you what, friend, every church on the Sunshine Coast will be flooded with people. Everywhere where Jesus is mentioned will be, will be flooded with people. As, a, as it says, by the next morning, there was no way of getting near the house. As the people came near, uh, as the people came near, in they would fall under, the, under God's power. And the whole city was stirred. The whole city was stirred. They shouted until the foundation of the house gave way. This house was on stilts, on concrete stumps. I've, it's got pictures of it here. It was about uh, two meters or so off the ground, had steps going up the front. But this house fell off the foundations. Nobody got hurt. Can you believe that? Uh, during these days, there were many people who received their baptism. The sick were healed. Sinners were saved just as, as they came in. There's one other story here, denominational 
denominations swept into revival. In November 1906, Gaston B. Cashwell, an evangelist with the Pentecostal Holiness Church of North Carolina, arrived at the Azusa Street Mission. He had read of the revival in publications called The Way of Faith. And he had come to see himself if Azusa Street was the revival he and others had been praying for. So desperate was Cashwell for a deeper walk with God that he borrowed money from a one -way, for a one-way train ticket and wearing only his suit came to Los, his only, sorry, wearing his only suit, <laughs> of course he was, came to Los Angeles. During Colwell's fir uh, first service at Azusa Street Mission, a young black man uh, laid his hands on him and prayed for him that he might receive the baptism. Such close radical uh, racial interactions rankled uh, Cashwell and he left the meeting offended and disappointed. Back in his hotel room, he suffered a crucifixion. <laughs> God got hold of him. He had to die to something. And God dealt severely with him about his racial prejudice. And later said that God gave him a love for blacks and a renewed hunger for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He re returned to the mission the next night and asked Seymour and several young black people to lay their hands on him and pray that he might receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Cashwell received the spirit baptism and according to his own accounts, spoke in English, German and French. Seymour received an offering for him and presented him with a new suit and enough money for his return to North Carolina. After returning home uh, to Dunn, North Carolina, Cashwell preached in a local holiness church and told of his experience in Los Angeles. Interest ran so high that he rented a three-story tobacco warehouse and conducted uh, a month-long Pentecostal revival. Thousands, can you hear this? Thousands. Thousands. Why? Because one man got filled with the Holy Spirit and started to speak about what God had done. Thousands crowded into the warehouse and scores were baptized with the Holy Spirit, spoke in other tongues. People came from all over Southeast and the revival came uh, to be known as another Azusa Street. I don't know about you, but does that make you a little bit hungry for the Holy Ghost? Then I, then I got hold of this book, Nancy's book. <laughs> Rocky gave us this book actually. Had to tear it out of her hands. <laughs> they told me their sp stories. This is a, a, a book about a young man that, that had, uh, had a checkered background. This young man uh, was a thief and uh, he was in so much trouble that he met up with some people and they said to him, well, you need to uh, leave Oklahoma and you need to come over to the East Coast or the West Coast. Yeah, come over there to, to anyhow. He went over with him. Says that he got into so much trouble it was either go there or go to jail. He was, 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 was a pickpocket. He could do whatever he wanted to do. But he's only a young man about 17 years of age and he finds himself 1,500 miles away from his hometown. I want to tell you, God will lead you and guide you. He's got things that He wants to do in your life if we just let Him. He's the most unexpected times God will come on your life. This young man uh, was with these people and he got into in such a difficult time. He fell in love with a young girl and the, his mate also fell in love with him. So they had a big fight. He, had, he smashed this other bloke up, but the girl left him anyhow. So he said he lost his best friend and he also lost the girl. There he was sitting on his own, didn't know what to do. And he was just sitting there and he said he saw these two old ladies walking towards him. And he said, oh, I wonder what they want. Because he'd been to, in, in times past, he's been to Pentecostal meetings with, with all the old Pentecostal people, the, the, the William Branhams and like that when he was a little kid. And he saw these people, he said, oh, they must really want to come and witness to me. So one sat on either side of him and they started to ask him questions about if, if he was saved, if he knew Jesus and things like that. And he said, no, I don't know that. Do you want to get saved? He said, oh, I don't know. I don't care really. And he was half-hearted about it. But he said, that something inside him just said, they said, can we pray with you? And he said, yes, you can pray with me. And they said, will you pray this prayer? And this prayer went out and he asked Jesus to come into his life. He said, I was half-hearted about it. I didn't really mean it. I didn't understand what I was doing. But he said, as I said that prayer, something happened. And he said, he felt a warmth come all over his body. And all of a sudden he, he looked at these ladies and he said with an astonishment on his face, he said, I'm saved. 
I am saved. And then he, held, he started to share with them about his predicament. And they took him to a place where there's a bunch of older people. But what these older people were, were people, that, they were the young children that went through the Azusa Street Revival some 60 years ago. And now they're, 70s, they're in the 60s and 70 years of age and they're all in this retirement village or this village anyhow. And so he, he started to get a hunger for the Holy Ghost. He got, started to get a hunger for the things of the Spirit. And he started to cry out to God and, 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 uh, and God just sort of come and helped him. And he, and he used to go in and, and, and he'd go and meet with these older people. And it says that his, his desire for uh, cookies and milk they all knew about it and they'd invite him to their house. And he said he would literally sit at the feet of these people that were now in their 60s and 70s that had gone through this Azusa Street revival. He would sit at their feet and, and drink and eat uh, chocolate cookies and hot or, or, or cold milk rather. And he would just sit there and eat this food. But he'd sit there and he'd start to talk to them about the Azusa Street revival. And he, said, he used to say to them, and he did this for six years, he said, tell me the stories. He was only 17 years of age himself. Tell me the stories. Tell me what you saw. Tell me the stories. And I was just thinking about the, the heartbeat beginning to beat again and, and as, as the stories were told. And there was a story there of a young girl that was three years of age. She said, I was three years of age when I was taken to Azusa Street by my parents. They would take me in and she said, I would go and sit under the seat where I'd have a little nap. But she said, by the time I woke up, she said the presence of God was so thick in that place that there was something that came into that place like a mist. And I suppose you could liken it to the smoke machines that we have in modern churches and in modern um, pro uh, programs and things like that that are done. And, and the smoke would just come in like a mist. And she said, it would, she said, over the years, she said, I breathed in and they called it the Shekinah glory. They called it a Shekinah glory. And she said that this mist would come in and, and as she got a little bit, she'd play with it and, and she would just be in it. And she said that, you know, when the worship began to rise, as the people began to sing in the spirit, that this, this, this mist would also begin to rise and get thick. And the people there, they just got used to it. They said also there, there were flames of fire that were going up to heaven and flames of fire that were coming down from heaven. Many times the... the uh, the fire brigade would come because somebody had said that there was a fire. This young girl said that times that she would go outside to have a look at it and it looked like a glow upon the roof. There was different manifestations, but it was a thing of the Spirit. This young woman that was three years of age got so touched by the Spirit of God that when, when as she grew older, she, she not, wasn't just a, a young girl anymore, but she became a pastor and she took over the ministry when Amy... What's when she re retired, she took over the ministry gift. This little girl that was once three is now leading this great ministry. There are others there that, that said, I was 16 or I was 17 when I went there. And as they started to share the stories and he would say, what was the greatest miracle you ever saw? What was the greatest thing you ever saw? And this, this girl started to share a story about how she said, we were there in the meeting and this woman came in and she had this big rag over her head where it was full of blood. And as she was walking in, you could obviously see, see she was in tremendous pain. And, it, and she said, and we walked over to her and started to talk to her, started to say, what happened? She said, oh, she said, I'm, I found my husband with another woman. And uh, she said, we've got into a fight and this adulterous woman bit off my ear. And, and he, he started to laugh a little bit and, the, and uh, this lady you know, chastised him for that and said it wasn't funny. And, and she said, but this was the greatest miracle I ever saw. This woman was in excruciating pain and we started to pray for her. And as we started to pray for her, you could see, and she started to say, it's, the pain is gone, the pain is gone, the pain is gone. And, and she said, we took the band, we took this rag off her head and had a look. And she said, to our astonishment, a brand new ear was beginning to grow. She said, I, that's what she said. She said, I'm sorry, but I didn't bring the ear with me. <laughs> Others said, what was the greatest miracle you'd ever seen? 
This young man, Andrew, he said, I was in a meeting, she said, he said, and I saw this young guy walking in and he had a club foot. And as he walked in, she said he was very embarrassed and he tried to hide it. And he walked up to him and he said, what's wrong? Why, what are you, why is, what's wrong? He said, I, I am embarrassed. And he said, and I don't want people to feel pity for me. But he said, do you believe you can be healed? He said, oh, I don't know. And he said, well, Jesus carried your stripes. He carried 39 stripes for your healing. He said, yeah, that was healing. That was for sickness and disease. He said, but I've got a club foot. He said, I don't have sick. He said, no, it doesn't matter. Jesus still heal you. And it says that, he, that they begin to pray and they begin to lay hands on him. And it said it just didn't go automatically quick. But he said in the matter of two to three minutes, this young man's foot began to open and become t totally whole and totally straight. And this young man jumped to his feet and started running and jumping. And this brother Andrew was running and shouting after him. Another story went on and they said that this, this young couple, they, just, they were only, she was 17, but she was married and, and uh, they were sort of together and, and they were praying for this, this, this particular person. And they said that he'd just had an accident and two of his hand, two of his fingers had been severed, pulled, pulled right out actually. And, it just, and his hand, it was in excruciating pain. And they said, do you believe that Jesus can heal you? He said, I've come for healing. You believe? He said, yes, I do. And they started to pray for him. And this young man grabbed hold of his hand and lifted it above his head. And he started to cry out to God for healing. And as the sister, his, his wife was there also holding on to, to this man's hand. And she was looking up there. And as she was looking up, she saw two fingers starting to grow out of this man's hand. And, and he got, she said, she got such a fright that she fainted. <laughs> So not only did he get his two fingers, but he said, in a matter of minutes, he had brand new fingernails as well. Friend, I'm talking about something here and I was gonna read these stories, but, but I, I, just for the matter of time, I, wanna, I want us to get so excited because there's stories in this book. There's a story in this book about a day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And something happened, a great sound from heaven came and it filled the place where they were seated. The mighty Holy Spirit power. Friend, if ever we needed a deluge of the Holy Ghost, it's today. If we ever needed a fresh Pentecost, it's today. If we ever needed a new fire to burn underneath us, it's today, amen. Because we're seeing so much rubbish and, and strife and trouble, goodness knows what. But you see, my Saviour Jesus needed to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. He went down to the river one day and there was a man by the name of John baptising. And he walked out to this John who had said, Behold the Lamb of God. And he said, Baptise me in water. And as he baptised him with water, and as he came out of the water, the, the Spirit of God descended upon him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus made mention of it in Acts chapter uh, 10, 38 talks about how the Spirit of God came upon him, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. In, in Luke chapter 4, 18, Jesus stood in the midst of a crowd and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me with the Holy Ghost and with power. He has anointed me. He has filled me with his power. What for? To go out there and heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to preach liberty to those who are brown, to heal the sick and to raise the dead. But I don't know about you, but we need a fresh Pentecost. We need a fresh Pentecost. We need a fresh fire to fall on us. We need a Holy Ghost anointing. If you want the fire to touch your life, you know that you need, perhaps you've drifted away a little bit, perhaps you haven't. Perhaps you're just so full of God, you want more, amen. I'm on this, I'll, I want more, amen. If you're here today and you just want more, you want the fire, you want whatever, just slip out the front and just let the fire of God touch your life today. Let that anointing come on your life today. Light the fire again, Lord. Light the fire again, Lord. Oh, look at this bunch of people that are hungry for God. That'll do me. This'll do me. Hallelujah. Bunch of people that want God. Amen. That's all. Just want God.